what is up YouTube and welcome to another video. In this video we're going to be taking a look at how to run RabbitMQ, the basic fundamentals of a message queue, why you even need one and we're also going to be taking a look at how to write a basic application that produces messages as well as consumes messages from the queue and if you guys enjoy this video be sure to like and subscribe because in the future I'll be showing you how to run a RabbitMQ cluster for a highly available production system as well as running RabbitMQ on a service like Kubernetes. So without Without further ado, let's go. So what are message queues? Now message queues is a form of service to service asynchronous communication. This is common and very popular in microservices and serverless architectures. Now why would we need RabbitMQ or a message queue? To understand why message queuing is important, we have to understand the concept of asynchronous messaging. Now let's take a look at a basic microservice example of service to service communication. In this example, service A makes a call to service B. This is usually done over a TCP connection. Now this call here is synchronous, meaning service A has to wait for service B to respond. If service B takes a long time to respond, this connection is potentially dragged out. Then we get added latency. If service B crashes or dies or fails to respond, service A may have to retry potentially multiple times in order to get a successful response. Now, as you can see, service A is somewhat coupled to service B. Now with asynchronous messaging, service A sends a request and continue with its life. It does not not care about an inline response. It does not care who processes the message, how long the message takes, and it's not directly coupled with service B. Now, in order to understand how asynchronous messaging is achieved, we have to understand message queuing. Now, asynchronous messaging is usually achieved using a message queue. Now, what is a message queue? Well, this is where RabbitMQ comes in. So instead of service A directly calling service B, service A places a message into the queue. Now service A can go on with its life and not worry about who processes that message. Service B now picks up that message, processes the message, and we have an outcome. In message queuing, service A is called the producer since it's producing messages. Service B is called the consumer since it's consuming messages. Asynchronous messaging is achieved with message queues and this is where RabbitMQ comes in. Now there's a couple of advantages here. Message queues can help so that one service is not directly dependent on another service. When you're writing code to build up service A to create a network packet and a request for service B, you usually start writing API contracts. And this means that service A is somewhat coupled with service B. Now these queues can usually help decouple these two services that would normally depend on each other. Queues can also help in cases where we can generate messages way faster than we can consume the messages. So this allows us to scale up the backend consumers to cater for the need of processing a ton of messages. It can also help with spreading the messages out to multiple consumers. This is called batching. So RabbitMQ is the most widely used open source message broker and RabbitMQ also has all of these features. Now we've spoke about asynchronous messaging. Also we've spoken about message queuing but it also provides delivery acknowledgement. Now delivery acknowledgement is a special feature of RabbitMQ. Let's say service Service A puts a message into the queue and let's say service B picks up that message from the queue. For some reason service B crashes. If you configure RabbitMQ with delivery acknowledgement it will expect service B to put an acknowledgement message back to the queue. If service B dies and, and the queue does not receive an acknowledgement, RabbitMQ will automatically put that message back to the queue for another consumer to pick up. And this adds resilience to message queues. RabbitMQ also has a great developer experience with many types of programming language compatibility. So we'll take a look at that in a second. Now, very importantly for DevOps folks, RabbitMQ also has a distributed deployment mechanism. So you can set up instances in a highly available manner, like a cluster. In the next 
video, we're going to be taking a look at how to start up RabbitMQ in a cluster mode and how to join multiple instances to make it highly available. RabbitMQ is also enterprise and cloud ready. So in a future video, we'll also take a look at how to run RabbitMQ in a highly available cluster on top of something like Kubernetes in the cloud. We'll also take a look at some tools and management plugins that um, RabbitMQ supports as well as management and monitoring tools. So RabbitMQ also supports tools like Prometheus integration so you can monitor it from your Prometheus instances. So let's take a look at getting started and how to install RabbitMQ. Now the best way to run RabbitMQ is using the Docker image so you can run it in production on something like a Kubernetes cluster. If you head over to Docker Hub, you search for RabbitMQ, you'll find the official images with all the different versions. They also have documents around showing what is RabbitMQ, how to run it using a Docker run command. There's some features like memory limits. We're also going to take a look at authentication using an Erlang cookie. There's also the management plugin that we're going to be enabling to get the UI dashboard. We're also going to take a look at how to enable plugins. So for those of you who are new to this channel, everything I do is on GitHub. I have the Docker development YouTube series, GitHub Repo. In here, I have a messaging folder and I have RabbitMQ. Everything I've done is documented in a readme file over here that you can find in the RabbitMQ folder. So remember to check out the links down below to this GitHub Repo so you can follow along. Now, especially if you're in DevOps, it's very important to understand the networking of running RabbitMQ, especially when it comes to running in a cluster. So what we're going to do locally, the first thing is we're going to run a local Docker network called Rabbit. This is so that every instance that we run can talk to each other. We're also going to run an application that's going to produce messages, consume messages, and they all have to run on the same network. Now, the easiest way to run RabbitMQ, as I said, is in Docker. So we're going to say Docker run in background mode. We're going to remove the container if it gets deleted, and we're going to run this container on the rabbits network and then we're also going to specify a host name of our rabbit instance a name for the container and then we're going to run rabbitmq the official image 3.8 now it's very important to understand the host name rabbitmq uses an identifier and then an at symbol and then the host name in order to talk to each other so if you're running rabbitmq on something like azure vms or ec2 instances you need to make sure that you know the host name of those instances so that these rabbitmq instances can find each other other. If you're running on something like Kubernetes, it's important to run it as a stateful set and not a deployment because deployment pods are ran have random host names. So now that I've started the container, we can see we have one RabbitMQ instance up and running. And you can see these are all the ports that it's exposing. Now, it's very important to know if you're running it in a cluster, we'll be using this port. And this is the communication port um, for applications to consume the queue. We can then say Docker logs Rabbit1, which is the container name, and we should see that our RabbitMQ Q instances up and running and healthy. We can also go inside of our Docker container using the docker exec command and we can run bash. And now that we're inside, we can use the RabbitMQ uh, CTL. This is the CLI tool we can use to manage RabbitMQ. So the Rabbit CLI is very useful for controlling your Rabbit node. So it has a couple of commands regarding nodes. So you can stop and start your, your application, which will leave the container image running. You can also reset it. So that's basically a command for the Redis node to leave a cluster. It also has a bunch of clustering commands. We'll be taking a look at this in a future video of how to create a RabbitMQ highly available cluster. There's also some replication commands, um, managing of users, access control, monitoring, as well as policies, virtual host, node configurations, the list goes on. So RabbitMQ also has a separate CLI called RabbitMQ plugins. And if you run that, there's a bunch of things you can do. You can disable, enable, and list different types of plugin integrations for RabbitMQ. Now, these are very useful since RabbitMQ provides a wide variety of plugins. One plugin is, for example, is the management interface. And another plugin that's quite useful is the Prometheus monitoring plugin. So if we run the RabbitMQ plugins list command, we can see a list of plugins that are, that are available in our instance. And you can see none of the them are enabled by default but you can see here we have like different authentication backends we have peer discovery plugins we have tracing plugins and we also have the prometheus plugin now rabbitmq also provides a management plugin as i mentioned earlier so to enable that plugin let's exit out of the container quickly and let's quickly delete the container 
and let's recreate the container but this time i'm going to expose port 8080 which internally in the container i'm going to expose port 15672 this is the management plugin ui port that we can use to browse to the uh, management instance over the browser so if i go ahead and run that and then go back into the pod I can then enable the plugin using the RabbitMQ plugin CLI. So I can say plugins enable RabbitMQ management. That'll go ahead and enable the management plugin. So now we see it's gone ahead and enabled a bunch of plugins to make the management capability to work. We can then say plugins list and we can see it's gone ahead and enabled web dispatch, management agent and the overall management plugin. And if I go over to the browser on localhost 8080, we can see we've arrived at the RabbitMQ da dashboard and you can just log in with the default default credentials which is guest and guest and this is the RabbitMQ overview page so you can see I have a one node in my cluster we can also see a listening port so this is the port that we're going to be using to develop an application that can put messages into the queue you can see the connections that are established to this instance and then RabbitMQ also has the concept of channels now channels are virtual connections to a specific queue so this is important because when we write a program we're going to be creating a connection to our RabbitMQ instance instance, we're then going to be creating a channel, which is a virtual connection directly to a queue. So we have to define a queue and then we can start putting messages into that queue. So here you can see we have channels and then we also have queues that will be established shortly. And then we also have an admin interface where we can add users um, and service accounts that can interact with RabbitMQ. So let's take a look at what it takes to write an application that pushes messages into the queue so we can see this thing in action. So to do that, we're going to head over to the Docker development YouTube series, GitHub repo. I have a messaging queue uh, folder, rabbit in queue. And in here, I'm going to create a new folder called applications. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is create an application that publishes messages into the queue. So we're going to do one application called the publisher. And for our application, I'm going to create a new Docker file. So you don't have to install anything on your machine. I'm going to write a very small go application so i'm going to say from golang um, 1.14 i'm going to run the alpine image and i'm going to run that as a build container and the next line i'm going to go ahead and install git since git is the dependency manager for go i'm then going to set my working directory to slash source and then i'm going to pull down three dependencies i'm going to say go get i'm going to pull my web application so this is going to be an api where we can push messages to and the api will put the messages into a queue using the um, RabbitMQ sdk and then we also have a logging driver just if we want to log stuff now our source code is going to go into a new file called publisher.go and after we've written that source code what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to copy publisher.go into our source directory and then to build it we're going to say go build build the publisher.go and now we have our um, docker container for our application but what we're going to do now is we want to make a lightweight one so we're going to say from alpine as our runtime we're going to then tell docker to copy out from the build layer which is this layer up top here we're going to copy out the publisher binary that we've built using the go build command and we're going to copy it into an app folder and then to start up our application we're just going to start it up with a command called app slash app slash publisher now we need to go and write some code so let's head over to the publisher.go and we're going to start with package main we're then going to import all our dependencies so this is just to log that's to log as well we import net http so that we can run http functionality we're going to run an http router which is going to be our web server for our api and we're going to pull in the rabbitmq sdk as well then to make this simple i need to obviously pass in a host name and a port and also a username and password to interact with rabbitmq so for that i'm just going to use some environment variables it makes it really easy to configure and then i'm going to go ahead and and create a main method now first thing we want to do in our main method is define our web server we then want to go ahead and define a route so we want to say route router.post and whenever messages comes over the slash publish endpoint we're going to take whatever's behind that as a message and we're going to put that into our queue so for that we're going to define a basic submit function just to keep the main method a little bit lean and we're just going to write something to console to say our application is running and then we're going to start up our application with http listen and serve method on port 80. so now that we have a web server up and running and go let's see what it takes to actually put messages into the queue so for that we're going to 
going to create and define our submit function, which is going to be taking a bunch of parameters from that web request. The next thing we're going to do here is grab our message. This is the message that comes over this post request as a parameter. For interest sake, we're just going to write our message to console. We're then going to go ahead and establish our connection with the queue. So we're going to use the RabbitMQ SDK and we're going to pass in a user, password, host and port. Now we also want to go ahead and handle that connection failure in case it fails and comes back with an error. We're also going to defer this connection and we're going to close it whenever this function exits. And the next bit is we're going to need to create a channel. Now remember a channel is basically that virtual connection that we establish with the queue. So in order to talk to a queue, we need to create a channel. So to do that, we use the connection and we create a channel. Similarly, we also have to handle the error just in case we fail to open a channel. And then we also have to defer that channel in case this function closes or errors out. We want to make sure we close the connection to that channel. And now that we have a channel, we can go ahead and declare the queue. So we say um, channel.queue declare and we can give it a name. So I'm just going to call this queue publisher. And there's also a bunch of settings and configuration you can look at about how the queue should behave. Then again, this is Golang. So we have to handle any errors that would come back from that in case we couldn't declare a queue. And now we can go ahead and publish a message um, on that queue. So we say um, channel dot publish we pass in the queue and we also pass in our message in here as a byte array. Then we also have to handle that again in case that comes back with an error that we fail to publish the message. And last but not least, I'm just going to write to console saying that we've published successfully. Now to build and run that, it's very simple. I've created a bunch of commands here. You can follow along. We're going to change directory to the location where that Docker file is. And we're going to say docker build dot dash T and I'm going to pass in my um, image name. That's going to go ahead as we can see, it's going to go ahead and compile that application and build up a container image. Now remember you've got to check whether your RabbitMQ instance is up and running. Also it has to be running on that Rabbit's network we created. And then the next step we can do is we can run our publisher application. So we say docker run minus IT. We run it on the same network. We also give it a host name. We also give it a bunch of environment variables. So we say um, the host to connect to. We're going to connect to Rabbit1. We're going to connect over that port and we pass in a username. I'm just going to use the guest username and password. We're going to expose port 8080 so we can interact with this API. And this is the image name. So you can see our application is now up and running. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up Postman. I'm just going to create a post request to localhost port 80 to that publish endpoint. And I can basically pass in any message here. So I can say hello and go ahead and send that. We can see that's gone ahead and published. We can see that our publisher has put the, has received the message hello and it's published it successfully to the queue. And interestingly, if we go over to the dashboard, we can see that there is now some interaction and activity happening on our queue. And and if we head over to queues, we can see that our queue has now been created here by our application. We can go ahead and access that queue. We can say get messages. Let's get the message. And we can see that we have a message in here with a payload of hello. So now we have an application that can push messages to a queue, but more importantly, how do we consume messages from that queue? So what we need to do now is write a consumer application that targets that same queue. Now that's very simple to do. In my applications folder here, I'm gonna create a new folder called consumer. And very similarly, I'm also going to create a new file in here. And I'm gonna start with another Docker file. Now this Docker file is identical to my producer, but I've just gone ahead and renamed the application file. So I'm still using go. I'm still using um, similar dependencies, but this time I'm not using an HTTP web server. I'm going to, instead of running publisher.go, I'm going to write a consumer.go. I'm going to pass it into source folder. I'm going to say go build, and I'm going to produce a runtime um, container image. And I'm just going to start up this time a binary called app slash consumer. So to create the application, we're going to um, create a new file called consumer.go. And similarly, we're going to start with package main. I'm going to pass in my dependencies. I'm also going to pass in the similar environment variables because we want the consumer to connect to the same instance of RabbitMQ. And I'm just going to write a main method. And in this uh, method, I'm going to create another one called consume. So let's go ahead and write that up. Now the code looks very similar to a publisher. Um, it also needs a connection. So we need to establish a connection passing in the same connection string. We also need to handle the error in case the connectivity fails. We need to go and create a channel, the virtual connection in order to connect. We have to handle that in case that fails. 
We also go have to go and declare our queue. So we're going to declare the queue with the same name that the publisher is using. And in case the queue declare fails, we have to go ahead and handle that. I can just write a message to console to say that the queue and the channel have been established. And then I'm going to go ahead and defer those connections. So if this um, function exits or cancels or errors out, the connection and the channels will automatically be closed. And now I'm also going to call the channel.consume function and pass in the name of the queue. And then here you can also pass in a bunch of settings. So this is where you can enable things like delivery acknowledgement and things as well. So you can see here we've, we've disabled auto acknowledgement. So I want to manually acknowledge when I know my transaction has been completed. And then we obviously have to handle in case that um, consume function fails, we have to handle that error. And then I'm going to go ahead and create a go channel. This is a channel that's going to run forever and it's going to be basically listening to messages coming onto the queue. So then I'm going to pass in a function to that um, go channel. You can see here I'm just creating a go function and what I'm doing is I'm just looping through the messages that are coming in over this consume function. I'm grabbing the message out of the um, body. So I'm also writing that to console to say that we've received the message and then here I'm passing in acknowledgement back to the queue and then I'm also writing to the console that we are now running. So to build this is very simple as well. I've got it documented into the readme if you want to build it. You just basically change directory to the consumer folder and we're going to say docker build and we're going to tag it this time as a consumer image. That'll go ahead and compile our app and build a container image out of it. And very similarly, we're going to run this by saying docker run IT on the rabbits network. We're going to pass in the same connection details to connect to our existing RabbitMQ instance and watch what happens when I run it. We can see we've established connection to the queue and we've automatically received a message. That's because our previous message is still sitting in that queue and has been picked up by this consumer. And if I go back to the RabbitMQ dashboard and I say get messages, we can see the queue is now empty since the message has been picked up by our consumer automatically. So now we can go ahead and interact with our API and publish several messages. So I can say, what is up YouTube? And if we take a look at the, at the consumer below, it's received all the messages and processed them. So hopefully this video helped you guys understand the basics and fundamentals practically and theoretically of RabbitMQ and how to write an application that produces and consumes messages out of that queue. Hopefully this video also helped you get your first RabbitMQ instance up and running and understand the basics of a queue. Now be sure to like and subscribe and tune in and follow along since I'll be showing you guys how to run RabbitMQ in a highly available manner for production systems. So we're going to take a look at how to set up a RabbitMQ cluster and then in a future video we'll also be taking a look at how to run RabbitMQ on Kubernetes. So hope you guys enjoyed the video and as always like and subscribe and until next time, peace.